this latest thing with Jerry Falwell, I don't know the truth. I'm just basing it on reports that I've seen. Uh, what a disappointment. A lot of us may have quoted him. But uh, he's definitely, uh, there's a lot of smoke and probably some fire in his life. Big thing it teaches us, and he's not the first. We've had several like this before. Evangelical leaders that fall. They're living double lives. Again, I come back to, what's the one thing you can trust? This. And you're going to see fruit play out in people's lives. And I can, I can say, you want to see somebody who looks more like Jesus. More like Jesus than they do the world. So what's our second part? There is an A and B on 5 too. So you have your spiritual armor. It's truth that gets you through. But also, it's right living before God. Did you get that breastplate of righteousness? Right living before God protects you. It's your breastplate. You've got to live according to the rules, regulations, the morals, the precepts of Jesus Christ. You try and live like Jesus, and that protects you. Verse 15, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel prepares you for action. And by the way, sitting in a pew is not action. Coming in and, and I want to be fed is not an action. Spending 40, 50, 60 years supping at the banquet table of the gospel and never once sharing it with anybody else is not action. It's spiritual warfare and it's truth. If you have been on the receiving end, there ought to be some feeding that takes place. Just what Jesus said at the beginning of this, the sheep and the goats, Get away from me. I know you not. Why, Lord? You did not feed me when I was hungry. You did not give me something to drink when I was thirsty. You did not visit me when I was in jail. You get that? By the way, I, I mentioned something a few weeks ago. Uh, Gary called me. I think he was traveling to Idaho when I made this mention. But he just saw a uh, news article and it's about the problem with schools today where uh, kids uh, don't have adequate internet at their home and so they're pulling up outside uh, fast food joints and they're using the internet in their car outside of fast food joints to try and do their, um, their online learning. There's a thousand kids in this, in this town that are doing that. And they're dealing with frontiers. Now, let me let that sink in. Frontier. Every one of you has cursed frontier. Right? Yes. You're lucky, lucky to get six megabytes. We've got 60. I think there's a great opportunity for this congregation to rise up and to address the needs of 1,000 children in our area, have tables and we could just do our education building right now. But we need people who are going to come and staff it. I can't be here every day. You can. But people on a rotational basis to come in, open up the building, and let our 60 megabytes help someone do distance learning. Because the big issue, and I hear this from the teachers when I'm with the teachers, the big issue is there's not a bandwidth broad enough with Frontier in order for them to watch their teachers online at home. We could do it. How much would you give as a congregation to have 20 families show up with their kids on our territory under our influence and do something? Amen. Well, I'm glad you said amen because when I said it a few weeks ago, I got no response. Because it's a spiritual warfare. Right outside those doors, there are people who are dying every day. And it's our responsibility to stand. So do you want to take a stand? It's here now. And we just have to be creative enough to do it. So the gospel prepares you for action. Verse 16, in addition to all this, take up your shield of faith 
with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. So faith is your defense. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and surprise, surprise, surprise. Salvation guards you. But did you notice something there? We only now get to our first weapon. Everything else has been protected. Scripture is the Holy Spirit's weapon. It's not your weapon. You don't go out, by the way, and thump somebody over the head for how horrible their life is because they're gay or they're a drug addict or they're pregnant outside of marriage or any of those things. That's not what the weapon is for. The Holy Spirit's weapon is in your life to make a change in your life so that you may affect change in someone else's life because people need to see Jesus. In Amen. Hallelujah. So let's wrap this up. Let's get to our real weapon. And that's the last three verses. 18, 19, and 20. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keeping on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, and whenever I speak, words may be given to me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Prayer is your weapon. I am so thankful that right now, in the other building, there's three people back there that have been praying for this service. I think one of the changes that we're seeing, because we're seeing growth in this church, and that's not happening in very many churches in the United States right now. But the growth we're seeing is because we are using that weapon, and we need to use it more. And by the way, it's the same people who prayed last time, two weeks ago. That's yet another opportunity for service. And it's the greatest weapon we have, prayer. Amen. It is. Pray. Pray without ceasing, Paul tells us. In all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Why? Because we need to remember to stand. We need to remember that there's a spiritual warfare that's taking place. And the people that annoy me, they're God's battleground. And He's loved them so much that Jesus died on the cross for them. And they might have rainbow hair. They might have tattoos. They might have a bulge in their belly because they did it. Uh, they got the cart before the horse. There might be all kinds of issues that's going on. But believe me, that is God's warfare. And we need to be serious about it. And we need to stop condemning people for doing what they're, they're already condemned. We need to bring them to the other side. Amen. Father, I just I give you thanks. I pray that at this moment, this time, we do heed your word. May we all just strap on our armor every day. May we stand and just be a difference in this world. And Father, when folks annoy us, and for, forgive us for the thoughts we have on the road when we're driving. Forgive us for the thoughts we have in Wally World. Uh, forgive us for just looking at other people as problems, as interference, even as foes. Forgive us. Father, may we see them through your eyes and may we, may we see them with compassion as sheep without a shepherd. May we see them through Jesus' eyes. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. something to celebrate about. Celebrate that God loves us. He loved us so much that he even gave up his son. Have you ever thought of what it really means to celebrate? We always want to celebrate with a crowd of people. 
We need a reason to celebrate. We celebrate the start of a new year. We celebrate birthdays. Anniversaries, holidays roll around once a year. But always there's a reason for us to celebrate. We do that every Sunday. It's most common, it's the most common reason uh, looks to the past, such as birthdays and anniversaries and national holidays. Sometimes we celebrate a person rather than an event. Memorial Day is for veterans. Labor Day recognizes workers. Valentine Day is for lovers. And St. Patrick's Day for those who could even recognize the color green. Nobody celebrates with a diet. Diet starts January 2nd, not the New Year's Day. <laughs> food and drink, often too much food and drink, and a very real part of a celebration. Finally, celebration is a happy time, even a joyous one. We use the same word celebrate to mean that we are taking the Lord's Supper. We often speak in our public worship of celebrating communion. We celebrate the Lord's Supper in a group. It may be a small group, maybe as small as just two people, but that's all that's required because God said he'd be there. We celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, for a reason, the greatest reason in the world. Jesus the Messiah died on the cross so we might have eternal life. And if eternal life is worth celebrating, then nothing is. The reason looks to the past, just like our other celebrations. To a hill at Calvary, it is a greater celebration in that it also looks to the present as we examine ourselves before we take. It's a greater yet, it's greater yet for it looks to the future. Because as we believe as Christians that Jesus is coming back. Some celebrations are for events, some are for persons, others for, uh, are for both. This is a celebration of the crucifixion and the crucified. Surprisingly enough, even the most sacred of celebrations must be done with food and drink. In its roots, the Passover, it was referred to as the feast. Other celebrations fatten the body, but this one feeds the soul. So then when you take it today, do not neglect its solemn aspect. But remember, this is a celebration. Take and eat with joy. Lord God, we just, we thank you so very much for loving us. Even though we're so, we're so unlovable at times. But Lord, you made that go away because you gave us hope and freedom in the fact that Jesus took our sins on himself and died at the cross. And that's what we celebrate right now because we celebrate the fact that his body and blood was given to cover our sins. And your grace covers us all the time as we are now adopted as your children. Lord, I just thank you so much for this. And I pray that you'll just build us up by what we are doing, and I pray that we'll each take a look at ourselves and make sure that we're doing the things that, that you need us and want us to do. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.